Welcome to Columbine United Church Online this week. Great to have you with us. Thank you for spending time with us in your day. Wanted to share a couple updates and announcements as we head into our service today. First of all, I cannot believe that next week is Palm Sunday. And then right around the corner on April 3rd and 4th, we have Easter weekend. So we will, of course, have services that are um, one service recorded online that will be available for you to watch with your family anytime Easter Sunday or Easter week. We will also have a, an event, an in-person um, service planned or several services over the weekend of April 3rd and 4th. So April 3rd, Saturday, we have a family Easter egg extravaganza at Clement Park at 1.30, followed by a service at 2.30. Then on Sunday, we have service times at 9.30 and 11 a.m. in Clement Park at the amphitheater. Um, bring a chair, bring your mask. You can also bring your own flowers for the flowering of the cross to any of these services with um, maybe six inch-ish cut stems so that we're not sharing and touching as many things in our COVID season. We are hoping the weather is good enough to be out in the park. And um, so we will do a weather check and if we need to cancel the service due to weather, we will decide that by Friday afternoon, April 2nd. So we hope to see you in person for Easter. Thank you to all of you who continue to support Columbine. We're so excited um, for the future that we are getting to build together as we continue to work on the building and that continues to come together. And as we continue in the life and ministry and mission of Columbine, we're so excited to have um, such faithful and enthusiastic givers leaders, volunteers, because you are the ones that help us be strong as we lean into the future. And we are so excited um, that we will be back together again one of these days and that um, we will have a building that is totally updated. It'll be pretty good. So pretty great. So thank you for all of your support. If you are interested in giving online, it is super easy to set up automated giving out of your bank account and secure. So we encourage you to go to columbineunited.church and set up automated giving. Um, it will simplify your life. If you have any questions, you can email Natalie at columbineunitedchurch.org and she can get you in touch with finance people who can, of course, help you also set that up. Thank you always for your generous support. During Lent, we have been showing a video each week to sort of open the service from a group called Work of the People that puts together creative videos. This week's video is called Fill This Land, Fill the Land. It's based on a poem by Kelly Ann Hall. What I love about this video is it speaks to the truth and the vision of what Jesus is getting at in the Sermon on the Mount. So all Lent we've been studying Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount, the teachings of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And so the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking about this vision of the kingdom of God, of the divine breaking out, of rising up, of permeating this world that we live in. So this video, these words of this poem speak to fill this land, God, with your peace, with your glory, with your justice with your goodness and restoration. Hear these words as we lead into the video this morning. My glory will fill the land. It will fill the land. I'll light the path and will guide you myself. Don't give up, follow me, and your heart will know eternal peace. Yes, your heart will flow with my eternal peace.
Hello everyone, it's me, Samantha, and today I am so excited to welcome Luke playing Judas, um, Kyle, one of our seniors as Defiance, and Natalie, one of our freshmen as Remorse. I want to invite you to listen to this inner struggle Judas is having. Enjoy. He was my friend and I betrayed him. You betrayed him. It is your fault that they arrested him and are going to crucify him. 
No, you are trying to help him. It is not your fault. All the crowds, all those people who demanded him to be crucified. He was supposed to be the Messiah, to save us all. I thought he was gonna lead an army to overthrow the Romans. I thought, I thought he just needed a wake up call. I was trying to help. I thought getting arrested would knock some sense into him. Never thought the crowds would demand his death. There you see, it isn't your fault. You were just trying to help your friend. Lies. You were skimming off the funds for your own gain long before you betrayed him. He trusted you to be the treasurer for the group, and you betrayed that trust too, embezzling at every opportunity. You were always thinking about yourself and trying to justify your actions that you knew were wrong. You were always secretly plotting evil things. I really did, do care about him. When we were together, he made me and the others feel whole. Felt so real, so genuine. But I wanted everything else too. Wealth, the prestige of being one of his chosen 12. One of the closest men in his army. The army, the Messiah. It's about your choices. You could choose his way or your way. He never forced you to do anything. He showed you the way and gave you the choice. You chose badly. No, you chose what you thought was right. You chose as best you could. It just turned out badly. Really? Do you really believe that? Did you really truly think about what could happen? Honestly, no. I feel that if I went there, there was a darkness, a, a pain I couldn't face. It was too hard. It isn't really a matter of good and bad or right and wrong, is it? It is about going beyond all, all of what people expect and living a new way. Isn't that what he was teaching? Oh, sure, a new way. Loving our enemies, knowing God loves us for who we are and everyone else. No one is that special. Don't you want to be special? That's just the point. You are special and God loves you for who you are. I don't think God loves me anymore. How could God? just betrayed his son. Choices, Judas. Even now, you can still make choices. 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 Thank you so much for helping us to learn about choices and to learn about how they can be hard. And now I want to invite you to relax and take a breath. Prepare yourself for worship. Maybe you need to light a candle. I have mine here. Or open up your Bible. But create a space in your home where you can experience the presence of God. Continue taking deep breaths and listen and reflect as Joe leads us in We Are the Light of the World, a fun rendition of the Beatitudes. And as you think, look at your light and think about how you are the light of the world and how the divine creates that light in you and others around you. Let's listen now. Blessed are they who are poor in spirit. This is the kingdom of God. Blessed is the Lord, make us poor in spirit. Bless us, the Lord our God. We are the light of the world. May our light shine before all. That they may see the good that we do.
Bless us, O oh Lord, when we share, share their sorrow. Bless us, O oh Lord, our God. We are the light of the world. May your light shine before all. That they may see the good that we do and give glory to God. Blessed are they who we praise so much. Bless us, O oh Lord, our God. Yeah. We, we are the light of the world. May our light shine before all. That they may see the good that we do and give glory to God. And give glory to God. And give glory. Thank you, Joe, for that great music. Joe and musicians, I cannot thank you enough. You've done the best music all throughout Lent. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, I'm out here in my reflective garden with St. Francis. Somebody asked me this past week how St. Francis fared in the blizzard. Well, you can tell he's a little buried. He's got a skull cap on today to keep him warm. But it's great to be out here on a snowy day, Tuesday afternoon up here in Conifer, Colorado. I want to read for you the scripture passage today. It comes to us from Matthew's Gospel, the seventh chapter, verses 16 and following. I'm going to read from the New International Version. Listen for God's word as it comes to us today. Jesus says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By the fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of God who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise person who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams arose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish person who built their house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished these, saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority, not as their teachers of the law. Here the scripture passage ends. May God bless these words now as I seek to apply them to our lives. You know... You know the people who make me the most nuts in life? Actually, there are a lot of people who make me nuts. But one of the people who really make me nuts are people who think they have all the answers. The answer people. They, they think they have all the answers. They're big-headed. They're egotistical. They're even narcissistic. And they're going to tell you what it is that you, that, that you need to believe based upon their own feelings. They're going to bang that into you. And I especially hate it when they're people of faith, when they're religious 
religious people or spiritual uh, people. If they have all the answers, they're going to keep on banging those into you until you believe exactly the way that they, that they believe. And you know, and if you don't believe them, they're going to send you out of the community. They're going to brand you a heretic, and they're never going to let you back into into the community of faith. You know, I have such a hard time with that. Those kind of people, they they're like fingernails on the chalkboard of life. I know I just kind of dated myself with that image. Who knows what a chalkboard anymore is, but you get the idea. Like fingers, they, they just make me insane. And you know what? I think they made Jesus insane as well. Jesus had no time for people who had all the answers. Instead, Jesus was looking for people who had all the right questions. I mean, think about it. That's what I'm concerned about, the right questions. Because the right questions means that you're curious. You're open-minded. You're going to be asking questions about what you believe about life, about spirituality, about faith, about God. You're going to ask questions to the point where maybe you even feel a little bit lost. But that's okay, because then you're going to start looking for a roadmap to guide you. You can start looking for a mentor who can lead you. You are going to be on a great exploration of faith. And I think that's what Jesus is concerned about, an exploration of faith. Because, I mean, in this passage, he has a pretty sharp condemnation for people who had all of the answers. You know, and that's what I love about this book uh, from Brian McLaren uh, that we've been reading. We've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, today's passages are the summation of the Sermon on the Mount, the final teachings of Jesus. And in this passage, he gives us some pretty sharp things that we need to pay attention to if he's going to be his, if we're going to be his disciple. And the first insight is to quit thinking as though you have all of the right answers. I mean, pay, pay attention to this. Jesus says to him, on that day, people are going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many miracles in your name? And Jesus, Jesus is going to say, get away from me. I did not even know you, you evildoers. That's pretty profound. Get away from you. I did not even know you, you evildoers. I mean, you think about it. These are people who think they have it all sewn up. They think they are spiritual giants that are prophesying. They're casting out demons. They're uh, doing miracles all in Jesus' name. And Jesus doesn't have any time for them. He says, get away from me, you spiritual giants. I don't want to have anything to do with you. Why is Jesus so impatient with them? Because they're closed-minded because they're doing all these things for self-aggrandizement and not for the sake of Jesus. I mean, think about this. He calls them evildoers. Why does he call them evildoers? Because think about this. Let's go back to these spiritual giants who are prophesying and casting out demons, doing miracles, and let's be those people on the receiving end of that. You're the one who's being prophesied to. You're the one who's having the demon cast out of. You are the one who all these miracles are being performed in front of. You know what? What is that going to give you? If these, if these people are doing these things in the name of Jesus, then what is it going to tell you about Jesus? You know, Jesus is not about prophesying and casting out demons and doing great miracles. He did those things, but did he really want his followers to do those? Because really wasn't Jesus about compassion and mercy and love and kindness. And that's what he wanted his disciples to be about, modeling that type of love and mercy and kindness to people. That's what Jesus is, is looking for. And so I think, you know, it begs the question, well, then how do we avoid becoming these type of people? How do we avoid becoming people who have all the answers? And I think that uh, Jesus tells, tells us very clearly in this passage, he says, anyone who does the will of God in heaven and follows them has a place in the kingdom of God. Anyone who does the will of God in heaven that is a person who has a place in the kingdom of God. So it's the bigger challenge. How do we discern what it means to follow the will of God? 
back in inside. It was kind of beginning to snow a little bit hard out there. My Bible was getting wet and my computer that had all my notes on it was getting wet. But I'm down in here. You know, my question is, what does it mean to discern the will of God? How do we discern the will of God? If we're not going to be an answer person, if we don't want to be that evildoer that Jesus was talking about, he said, the one who discerns the will of my Father in heaven and does them. So what it begs the question, how do we discern the will of God in heaven? Well, you know, for me, it goes back to what Jesus was talking about in the opening movement about the narrow gate and the wide gate, that uh, min- the wide gate is open and many, uh, many people follow it. It leads to destruction. But then there's this narrow gate and only a few people have it and it leads to eternal life. Well, you know, how do you find that narrow gate? I was talking with my uh, small group about it this past week. And we all were talking about to find the narrow gate takes intention. It takes work. It takes discipline. It takes daily work as we seek to understand what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus and how we integrate that into our into our lives. And that, that takes us to the narrow gate. It takes us to the place where we can enter into the kingdom of God. And so that narrow gate is trying to do the hard work of discerning the will of God. Now, how do you go about discerning the will of God? Well, you know, for me, this is a central path. I wrote about this in my book, The Jesus Path. It's one of the eight paths that we follow in our life, in our Christian faith that is to uh, discern the will of God. And to do to discern the will of God, there's three scripture passages that I always ask myself when I engage in something. The first scripture passage that I that I always uh, ask myself is Micah 6 8. What does the Lord require of you but to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God? Those things, justice, mercy, and humility with God. Those three things, I ask myself, you know, is this decision that I'm going to be making, is it have to do with justice, mercy, and kindness? Is somehow God's will in line with that? And then the other thing I ask myself is the two great commandments. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. So I'm talking about Micah 6, 8, and I bring in this passage about loving God with my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I kind of wrestle with uh, those two passages. And then the third passage that I wrestle with is when Jesus said, every time you take care of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have taken care of me. So there's that. Is this decision that I'm going to make? Is it dealing with the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters? Am I working to taking care of the least of these? And then you know what I do? I hold these things up as a compass in front of me, these three passages, and I let them hold me in tension. So let's say you have a difficult decision in your life and you need to discern what is God's will. And I believe that we need to discern God's will probably at some point in every day of our life, especially if you're out there and you're working in the world, you have to figure out what is God's will. And so for me, I come back to these decisions. Like maybe you have a direct uh, report, somebody reports to you and you need to supervise them. Maybe you have uh, a teenager that's kind of stepping out of line. Or maybe you have an aging parent that you need to make sure that you are taking care of and you are guiding them. You know, all these different decisions that we have to make. And as people of faith, we have to ask ourselves, we just can't willy-nilly make a decision. No, we have to ask ourselves what is the will of God? And that's why when I go back to one of these decisions, I ask myself, Micah 6, 8, justice, mercy, kindness, God's love, the two great commandments. You know, serving the least of these, my brothers and sisters, and they, you know, these kind of act like a compass where I kind of look for guidance. And then eventually, you know, you have to come to a place where you make a decision. You have to at least start acting. But then you've done the hard work of entering by the narrow gate. You have done the work of trying to discern the will of God. You know what? I think God honors those decisions. I think God honors when you wrestle with the uh, with the nature of God's will. Because, you know, it takes us to the last movement of this passage when Jesus talks about the wise and foolish carpenter. The foolish carpenter built his house upon the sand and the flood came and the wind blew and the rains fell down and the house was was destroyed, whereas the wise carpenter was the one who built it on a foundation, and the rains came, and the floods grew, and the winds blew, and but the house stood.
And what is the difference between these two uh, two carpenters? It's because the, Jesus said, the one who takes my words and puts them into practice. Puts them into practice. I love that. Puts them into practice. You know, the great masters of all the arts, uh, all the music, the musicians of the world, you know, the ones who are really gifted, they never take their gift for granted. They work and they work. They practice and they practice. You know, uh, many of you know that I uh, I pretend to play the violin. <laughs> I actually love to play the violin, but I, you know, someday I will play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star without it sounding like a cat uh, being stepped on. I mean, it's just so bad. But I love to put touch the violin at least once a day. Usually it's every other day, but I like to touch it and hold it and practice it for just a few minutes every day. It's a way of practice, practice, practice. You know, I think it's the same way with the Christian faith. To take these words of Jesus and to bring them into our lives takes practice. Every day you have to wrestle with what is God's will. Every day you have to ask yourself, Micah 6, 8, the two great commandments, taking care of the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters. You practice this. You make actions. You make mistakes. You come back. You practice entering the narrow gate. You know, these are the things that keep you from being an answer person with all the great answers. But humbly ask the right questions. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? That's the great question. And how can I fulfill that in my life? God's will, Micah 6, 8. The two great commandments, taking care of the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters. That is what we use to discern the will of God. You know, being a disciple of Jesus is hard work. You know, it's being willing to look for the narrow gate. It's being willing to ask ourselves, what does it mean to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God? It means being willing to serve the least of Jesus' brothers and sisters. It means loving God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and putting this all of it into practice, practice, practice. Day in and day out, practice. You know, one of the things I never want to hear Jesus say to me is, get away from me, you evildoer. You know, and I can say to him, Lord, Lord, did I not preach all these sermons and teach all these classes and counsel all these people? And Jesus is going to say to me, could say to me, get away from me, you evildoer. I never know you. Now, that's kind of a comeuppance, isn't it? It makes us stop back and reflect on who we are as children of God and as disciples of Jesus. You know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount earlier in the sermon, he says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You know, and that's a kind of a, a hard thing to hear because, I mean, really, who's perfect? Well, nobody is perfect. If you're perfect, then you're one of those answer people again that I don't like. But instead, I think perfection is a good thing to strive for. Because when we strive for perfection, we realize that we don't have all the answers. When we strive for perfection, we realize with humility that we have a long way to go. And you know what? I think Jesus honors that search and that striving for perfection. Because in the end, when we strive for perfection, we know we need God's mercy and God's love and God's grace. And I think ultimately, that what that is what brings us into the presence of God. Now let's hear Jill lead us in prayer and the Lord's Prayer. Steve, thank you for your message today. You know, I thought I could hear red wing blackbirds in the background. Isn't it interesting? Several people have said in these last couple snowstorms that even though the snow is coming down, they have to, there's just birds everywhere. This morning when I was out too, I thought I could hear spring birds even as the snow is falling. It's kind of an odd contrast, but thank you for your great scenery that you always share with us, Steve. Let's take a moment now to be centered in prayer and we will join our hearts and our words to say the Lord's Prayer after a moment. God, we, we see in Jesus's life this abundant, this invitation to live in your abundance, to live in your joy, to live in your peace, to seek to live um, 
the way that is the narrow gate. We realize that this life takes work, choices, intentionality. This life of formation that leads us in the path of goodness and righteousness. And so in the places where we feel tired, in places where we feel like we just have lost hope or we don't know what to do next, we pray that you would restore our courage, our hope, our vision to continue on in seeking this life, this path that leads to righteousness and goodness. We thank you for the words of Micah to seek justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly. We pray that we would be a people who are defined and shaped by humility, justice, and mercy. That we would be shaped to be a people who look like you, who taste like you, who smell like you. Um, that people know whose we are by how we live by the condition of our heart, but also by how we act and our actions. And so we're reminded by how important our actions are, that it's one thing to believe something, but it's a whole nother thing to actually live that out. And so help us be a people, individually and corporately, of bold, compassionate action. Help us be a people who are characterized above all by love, in everything we do. We pray and think of those among us who are sick, who are um, battling disease, cancer, recovering from surgery. We think of those in the beginning of their lives in these days, and we think of those who are at the end of their lives. We pray for mercy and peace for all in our community, um, in our nation, and in our world. Would you now join your voices with me to pray this prayer that's tucked right here in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, these simple words that Jesus invites us to come back to, the Lord's Prayer. So join your voices with me in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So now we are get to sing our last song, and it is Beautiful Things. It kind of goes, it's like a perfect book end of the service with this fill this land this promise, this hope that um, God is making all things beautiful. This idea of restoration, of renewal, of coming alive. And so let us celebrate together as we listen to this song.
Thank you, Joe, and musicians, for that beautiful song. I just love that, the beautiful things, making life a beautiful place. I just love that. So now we come to the end of our worship video. You know, you've seen so many different things. Samantha and the kids did a great Lenten video. Uh, we had Joe with all the beautiful music, uh, uh, Jill with the beautiful prayer and the Lord's Prayer. You know, all of us work together to make these videos. You know, Dwight and Natalie look, work behind the scenes. All of us on the staff work together. And, and of course, Tag, who stitches all the videos together. This is our gift to you. This is our offering to you. And that's why I want you to do more than just turn off the video and then kind of go on with your day. But I want you to think about this. I want you to think about the Sermon on the Mount, the summation of the Sermon on the Mount. What does it mean for you to enter by the narrow gate? What does it mean for you to not have all the answers and to be a person who questions? What does it mean to be a wise person building your house on solid ground, doing the will of God, taking the teachings of Jesus and practice them? See, I think those are the things I want you to contemplate today. I want you to contemplate what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus. May God bless you and keep you, shape you and mold you, ah, love you and hold you. This day forth, now and forevermore. Amen. Now let's hear a beautiful choral, uh, choral response and end to the service.